It's fun to be here, for me anyway. I hope you guys have fun too. If you don't, that's okay. I'll give you double your money back. And if you do, I'll pay you double what I paid you to be here. So either way, you're getting double money. It's great to get some money tonight, huh? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's testimony night. It's rave night too. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I love that. Um, my name is Paul. I'm a grateful Christian believer who struggles with pornography and codependency. I'd like to take some time to share my testimony with you. Uh, before I got into Celebrate Recovery, my life was not just a mess, but a gigantic series of messes. I lost several jobs, lost several friendships. I broke several trusts and several laws along the way, and I fell deep into the world and deep into sin. As a child, I seemed to have things pretty good. I grew up in a home that had plenty of money, so I had plenty of things. My parents encouraged me to strive for success, and as a matter of course, I find myself, found myself in all the right classes, doing all the right things, or so I thought. We were dedicated church attenders, but attendance in church was nothing more than that, attendance. We went every Sunday. I went to Sunday school each week and VBS in the summers. I went to all the youth functions as well, but nothing really seemed to sink in because I was just going. Christian life and values were not modeled in my family. While in my second year of college, I met my first wife, an agnostic who had some vague curiosity toward faith, but not much more. We moved in together after my third year of college and were married after my fourth. We tried a couple of churches a couple of times, but it was too much of a burden to get up and go somewhere on a Sunday morning, so we quickly dropped out of that scene. As I neglected my faith, I also began to question it. Soon I had fallen completely away from all things religious. I remember how difficult it was when I finally made the decision to express out loud that I no longer believed. My first marriage was not successful. I had an affair before my first anniversary. My wife did not know about it until after our divorce, but it showed my commitment to the relationship was not strong. After moving several times following our graduations from college, we found ourselves in Ridgecrest once again. On Mother's Day weekend, she left me and my one-year-old daughter for another man from work. This was my first lesson in needing God. I was working at a local school and had met a wacky Christian Jesus freak of a lady named Beverly. I used to hear her talking at lunch all the time about all the wonderful things that her God did for her. I laughed myself all the time because she was too myopic to recognize a little thing we like to call coincidence. When my wife left, I kept hearing Bev's words about her own faith running over and over in my head. I was desperate. So I asked her to tell me more. Soon I was attending church with her and her family. Things were not great again, but they were getting better. Remember that word for later. One of my struggles is with self-esteem. I never thought that I was quite good enough. Throughout junior high and high school, my best friend was the class heartthrob, so most of the interest that girls showed to me was due to the fact that they wanted to get closer to my friend Donnie. This always made me question my ability to get a girlfriend. I never tried for the cutest or the prettiest because I assumed that they would reject me. Fast forward to the future again. Over time, Bev and I began to see each other romantically. We lived just two houses from each other, and our daughters loved to spend time together, so it was a pretty natural fit. I had heard stories about one of her daughters that weren't very positive. I began to ask myself questions, and in time, my curiosity wandered. One evening, I molested one of her daughters. I tried to pass it off as an accident, and even spoke to her about it in that way later. The event scared me, and I put distance between me and her. What I didn't realize was how much it scared her as well. About a year later, Bev and I were married, and I found myself again tempted by my lust. I tried to cover this up by viewing pornography on the internet. This was in the mid-90s, and my family was not very tech-savvy, so I was able to operate pretty much unknown. Each time I would view pictures, it would build up more desires in my heart. I began pushing God and faith further away as I compartmentalized my life. I did everything I could to make myself look good to the world and to the church. I found my way onto various boards. I worked in different ministries. I was a constant PR man for myself. 
My idea was that if I could paint myself as ultra good and my new daughter, my victim, as ultra bad, I would be able to deflect any possible accusations that she might make. In time, I developed a pattern or cycle of addiction. I would have urges to touch my daughter, bury those urges by looking at pornography, create a ton of stress, and eventually hurt her again. The grip of pornography grew stronger each time. My feelings of guilt waned as my need for new pictures increased. I would spend time late at night on the computer searching. I even took sick days from work to have time alone to feed my growing addiction. By the time I hit my bottom, I was even gathering photos during school hours while my fifth grade class was doing work. The constant fear of being caught created a huge amount of stress. I developed a stammer in my speech pattern that seemed to come from out of nowhere. It was only after I was caught and my secret was no longer a secret that I noticed it being gone. My sin was eventually brought to the foreground of my life. In 2000, I was charged and convicted of several counts ranging from lewd and lascivious behavior to annoying or molesting a minor. I spent eight months in Laredo jail and five years on felony probation. I had to go through several years of counseling through Kern County Mental Health. For the first six months of my incarceration, I maintained my innocence. But the day after Christmas, I finally confessed to my family that I had been lying and that I was truly guilty. When I came home, I thought I had left my demons in the past, and I was wrong. The stress of unemployment and unemployability weighed heavy on me, and I soon found myself once again gathering photos on the Internet. I was asked to leave my church, my life was again a huge mess. We visited a new church on Easter Sunday and became regular tenders, then members, soon after. For Thanksgiving, we were asked to share our testimony at a combined service. I asked Pastor Glenn, the senior pastor at the time, what he wanted me to share and how specific he wanted me to be about my past. He gave me this simple instruction on what to say. I have no idea. God will tell you what to say, and I'm fine with that. Well, gee, thanks. After bearing our souls to about uh, 700 people, we were pleased to accept the outpouring of love from most of those same folks. One person came to me and commented that the only difference between me and the other people in attendance was that my sins had been printed in the local newspaper. I was also confronted by Jim, the leader of a 12-step recovery group called Celebrate Recovery. He continued to hound me about coming to see our meetings throughout December, and I finally gave in during the first weeks of January. My experience was eye-opening. I wandered the halls of the church looking for what I thought I would find there. The folks I choose to call those people. You know the ones I'm talking about. Strung out, drawn out, drugged out people who are barely functioning in the real world. I walked past the actual meeting because when I glanced in and it appeared to be a church meeting of some sort, but obviously not Celebrate Recovery. To my chagrin and delight, I was wrong. Celebrate Recovery is filled with all types of people. After attending CR for a while, I began taking more responsibility at meetings. Being a former school teacher, I was asked to share lessons and lead a men's open share group. My life was changing and I was becoming more healthy. My wife was attending and things were looking up. As a part of my probation agreement, I was required to attend meetings and undergo counseling through Kern County Department of Mental Health. I drove to Bakersfield weekly, often twice or more, and participated in a variety of group and individual programs. The problem is that it wasn't sinking in. I was trying hard to get through and complete their program so I could mark that checkbox off on my probation requirements. However, the combination of forensics, the umbrella name for Kern County Mental Health, and CR began to blend into a useful program that was changing my life. I was working as a general laborer for a local contractor. I didn't make lots of money, but the bills were getting paid. As I worked my steps for the first time, everything was just this parade of amazing learning. Light bulbs kept going on like flash bulbs on a red carpet. As I worked my way through the steps for the first time, I fell in love with step four. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. It was in this step that I was able to take a 30,000-foot look at my life. I had been so busy using a microscope to try to 
react to life as it came to me. I never took time to move back and try to get the whole picture. The amazing thing is that my whole experience of losing my career in teaching and having my story told in the paper gave me the perfect opportunity to stop being reactive. I could actually take a look at my life as a whole instead of a series of cells on a film reel. Eventually, the strain of concrete work took its toll on my back, and I chose to move out of the construction business. I tried various jobs over a period of years, and each new venture left me further in debt. I spent several years unemployed off and on. Because of my past, it's not easy to convince employers to take a chance on me. Several years ago, I was blessed to get a job at Starbucks. It was amazing. I got talk, paid to talk and drink coffee. Who'd have thunk it? In the course of my doing my job there, people would eventually find out that I wasn't just Paul Pippin, but I was that Paul Pippin, the guy from the newspaper back in 01. The power of that knowledge can often be too much for people. As prejudices sink in, my coffee tends to grow cold. This happened five years ago, and I was accused of doing things at work. Although I was completely innocent of the charges and although I was eventually completely cleared by the company and the court, I find myself again no longer employable. I've sent out the resumes and gone to the interviews and even had a job offer, but my past always comes in to save the day and keep me without a job job. It hasn't been an easy transition. Whenever I'm put in a new place, I feel like my past makes me stick out like a sore thumb. I'm never really sure who wants to shake my hand and who wants to just shake me. It's been a long time since I've led Celebrate Recovery. I sometimes think that if I were to write my autobiography, I'd have to call it, I lost every job I ever loved because that's what I do. Knowing whether to stay down or get back up can be a difficult thing when you're lying face down in the mud. And sometimes I think that God has kept my training wheels on because he knows that my balance is good, but not great. There are a lot of people who have come to support me tonight, and for that I'm humbled and grateful. But there are more who didn't make it. I'm here tonight in front of you, not because of my own ability, not because of my own drive, not because of my own greatness, but because of love. A while back, my wife and I were interviewed by a newspaper reporter, and she asked Bev why she had stayed with me through all I've been through. I'll let her share her answer with you on another night, but to me, the answer is simple. It's love. A dear friend of mine got this ministry started here at RCA. It wasn't me. It was my friend Jenny who talked to people and coaxed me out of my cave. Why? That's right, love. You've heard my story, and I can tell you that most of the friends I have today did not know me 15 years ago. The friendships I had from childhood were mostly dashed on the rocks of my sordid past. But I have one friend who has and will remain by my side, and that's my Jesus. It's all about love. Without it, I am nothing, and with it, I can climb the highest heights. I'm not perfect. I fail miserably. I let people down all the time. People used to say I was the teacher. People used to say I was the soccer coach. People used to say I was the Starbucks guy. People used to say I was the felon. People used to say I was the child molester. I think I prefer that you just call me the guy that Jesus loves. Yeah, that's me. That's all of us. My life now is different, and that's how I like to put it, different. I hear people say it's better all the time, but I'm not sure I like that as much as I like different. Here's the thing. When people talk about getting better, more importantly, when I talk about getting better, I weigh it in relation to where I am and where I've been. My life now is not even close to what I thought it would be when I began this journey. When I look into the future, I am limited by the present, I have a difficult time extrapolating now into up yonder because there is too much of my now filter applied to what I'm trying to envision. I have learned that God sees the future and leaves the now to me. 
I catch glimpses, blurry, fuzzy glimpses, but I don't get a sharp, crisp idea of what tomorrow holds. So different is as good as I can say. I know now that I have a relationship with a daughter that I had lost. I have four grandchildren who call me Papa because that's my name. I have a daughter in Hawaii. She has a three-year-old and she's a dentist, but she still finds time to call me every day just to let me know that she loves me. I have a wife who loves me and she knows full well the heinous actions that I've committed. I have friends who call on me to give them advice. I've really doubled down on my third step. It's not easy for me to give up control, but I am certain that when I do give my control over to God, he does exceedingly wonderful things. In following God's leading, I finally got that job job when RCA asked me if it would be okay to give me a small stipend each month to do some video work a few years ago. Now, God has opened doors. God's opened doors like Bruce Lee people. I've been able to say yes to a 16-year call on my life to return to prison and bring love to those who are incarcerated. It has been so incredibly rewarding. When I first met the guys in my Saturday CRI group, they welcomed me with love and joy, telling me that they had been praying for my arrival for two years. Me. My initial thought was people usually pray for me to leave, not to arrive. It was truly humbling. And as much as I knew that I was blessing them, the blessing I received was far greater than the one I gave. God is good. I've learned many things about recovery, but perhaps this one is near the top of the list. You never get done. I had heard that over the years, but I'd never really processed the truth in the statement. Even though I was attending all the meetings I was required to attend, as well as others like CR, I got a little comfortable. My comfort allowed me to get lazy, and the lazy allowed me to begin to wander from my straight and narrow walk. I found myself nibbling at the edges of safety, and eventually I had nibbled off enough of my limb that I fell from the tree. The verse we read from 1 Corinthians 10, 12 really rings true to me now. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. My favorite step used to be step four because I felt so free when I sat down and wrote that first inventory. Then as I started seeing healing through making amends, I became a step nine guy. Now, now I'm most fond of step 10. I'm a bit of a hoarder, so I was doing the same thing with my recovery, just letting stuff pile up. When I really adopted a step 10 mindset, my stress began to dissipate. I learned a valuable lesson. I must always stay diligent in my walk. I cannot stand pat with the cards I have, but must always pay attention to what's going on around me. Thankfully, when I stumbled, I did it with a safety net. My accountability partners, my sponsor, my family, they were all there to let me know that while they didn't approve of my actions, they did still love me. I saw that I could move on from this mistake and get back on track. That's the reason I love the blue chip, the first-timers chip, or the one-day chip, this one right here. I love the nowness of a blue chip. It says to me that I can always get back on the wagon. I'm not advocating falling off. But honestly, how many thing do you, things do you know that allow you to make a mistake and have do-overs? We don't escape the natural consequences of our actions. The work, I'm sorry, the world will still look at us through its own filters. I continue to pay the price for my actions. Consequences don't care how good we are now. They simply collect the payments for our past wrongs. And here's a little nugget of truth that comes into play. It is what it is. A friend once explained that very fact to me. They spoke of their husband, who now lives life with just nine of his original allotment of ten fingers. He lost the finger due to carelessness with a saw. Now, since that time, he has reportedly been very diligent when working with tools. He has treated his family with great love, care, and respect. He has been a solid employee at the firm where he works. But the funny thing is, his finger still has not grown back. That silly stub 
just laughs at him, even though he seems to deserve all ten fingers. We are not going to get all our stuff back just because we have decided to be in recovery. I'm not going to wake up one day with a big promotion waiting at my front door. But I know that I've thrown my hat in the ring with Christ and with CR. I know that my mistakes are covered. I know that no matter how far I fall, I can always get back up. And here's the kicker. So can you. We are here. I am here to celebrate recovery. I celebrate my recovery as it happens. There's struggles and sometimes I feel trapped behind a wall of solitude and depression. I feel disillusioned and without hope. But I recall Psalm 118, 24. This is the Lord the day has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Principle 7 says, reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and gain the power to control, to follow his will. Blessed are those who celebrate recovery. Thanks for letting me share.